it's my great pleasure to have uh, Nick and Joy Wise in the podcast. They are from the US, so they are my guests from the greatest distance so far. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for coming. It's my great honor to have you to have you here. Thank you for having yeah, us. Yeah, thank you. Um, welcome and thanks for joining us. You visited the Czech Republic to race in the Canix Open, which was the biggest dryland race of the season. And I must say, I was really surprised that you came across the globe to uh, race for four kilometers, actually. How did it happen that you decide to race at uh, that event? So I'm part of the nonstop international cane across team. And right. as the race was being organized, nonstop had reached out to me and asked if I would attend the race. And I looked at the details and just was excited for the whole event and excited to attend a race that was going to be that large with that type of competition. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. And did you race as well, Joy, right? Yes, I did. Um, so the race was actually on my birthday and I told Nick, like, what better way to celebrate my birthday than getting to spend it with my dog racing yeah. on the trail? Yeah, that's uh, cool. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah, ah. Sunday. Yes. <laughs> Sunday. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. yeah. And then uh, I know you plan to go back to the US just uh, after the race, but then you had really bad experience at the Prague airport and they didn't let you travel with your dog. Uh, can you tell us what actually happened there? Yeah, when we arrived in Prague, they had told us that the crate that Anarchy had flown in was too small. And so we bought a bigger crate for him. And I had actually asked if Oso's crate was good and they told me it was. Well, since we had to sell one of our old crates, we actually sold the smallest one, moved Oso into a bigger one. And when we got to the Prague airport to leave, They told us that Oso's crate wasn't big enough and he had to fly in the same largest size crate that Anarchy that we had already bought for Anarchy. So, um, yeah, so now we've had to find a, a second crate. Yeah, and uh, luckily we, <laughs> I, <laughs> we we did. And I think that it's only two crates of this size available in Czech Republic and now you own them. So if anybody wants to fly to US now, it's no chance. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, so I mean, we put both dogs in larger crates and did more than what, what we were asked. And so, but you know what? It's okay. We got a couple extra days here to explore. So yeah, yeah. And, and actually it's a bad luck, but I'm really happy to have you here yeah. and we can have the podcast it's, and yeah, spend some time together. Yes. Yeah. It's worked out really well, actually. So. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And maybe tell us what uh, what is the size of your dog, so people can imagine why mm. why they ask you to have so big crates. Because actually, the crates you are now having they are huge. They're huge. Yes. Yeah. So I, I'll go ahead and apologize because I'm an American, so I think an imperial unit. So it might take me a second to convert everything. <laughs> no worries. But, Anarchy, the grayster that I run with, uh, he weighs 36 to 37 kilos. When he stands at my side, I can place my hand flat on his shoulders with me standing straight up. Mm -hmm. um, Oso is a husky mix, and he weighs about 27, 28 kilos. And um, he's, oh, he's probably about 10 centimeters shorter than mm -hmm. Anarchy is. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So yeah, and I saw your crates. You you came with, and mm -hmm. uh, from my point of view, they are just perfect size yeah. for them yeah. because what they have now, it's uh, maybe I'm mistaken, but I think it's maybe even more dangerous for the dogs. Too big. Yeah, it's yeah. too big. They have just too much space mm -hmm. to like, let's say, slide inside. So mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah, it, it's kind of funny because at home, when we feed the dogs, we feed them in the crates and we always let the dogs pick which crate they want to go in if they're the first one there. Yeah. And Anarchy always chooses the size of crate that Oso the smaller flies ones. in, which is two sizes smaller than what they're requiring him to fly home in. Yeah, uh, it's uh, it's crazy. But yeah, hopefully we, we fix that uh, in the end so you can go home tomorrow in with the new crates. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. Uh, is there, I would like to stay a little bit uh, in the topic of flying with the mm -hmm. dogs because it's not so common uh, here in Europe. Sure. Uh, everything is quite uh, yeah. short drive. So even if we go to Norway, it's quite normal for us to just drive. But uh, how this is in the US, it's normal to fly with the dogs like uh, inland or it's also more common to drive? 
We only fly with our dogs if we can't drive there. So even in North America, we drive everywhere just because it's so much cheaper to drive places than it is to try to fly with the dogs. Sure. Mm-hmm. And uh, what is your experience when experience when you travel across uh, the Atlantic with the dogs? Do they handle it well or uh, are they stressed after the flights? So when we fly with the dogs, we try to keep the routine very similar to our routine when we drive with the dogs. And so when we're driving to races, we generally leave in the evenings, drive all night and arrive in the mornings. That way the dogs are loaded up in the crates while it's nighttime and they sleep. Oh, when we fly, we try to book overnight flights also. That way we get to the airport, you know, late in the afternoon, they load up in their crates, they go to sleep and when they wake up, it's morning in Europe. Okay, okay. So they they ju- they are just fine with mm-hmm. flights yeah. like that. Okay. And was it uh w- was it uh only one flight or did you have to uh switch the flights on the way here? We had a connection in Frankfurt. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Um Have you had any issues uh, while flying with the dogs before or this experience is the first one? (laughs) This is the first one. The the very first one. Uh, Up until now, it's been really good. Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry that it happened uh, oh, here. No, it's, <laughs> you know, yeah, it's okay. yeah, yeah. I heard that there were some new rules for the European Union regarding the size of the crates. So maybe that's the reason because maybe that and we also had a very early flight and maybe one of the um, airline yep. staff that was helping us just Just woke a up a little day. too early or, or who knows so yeah, but, yeah. but you know, i know what you mean yeah, yeah but it, it, and looking back on it now we're actually happy because it's yeah. allowed us to see a little bit more of the czech republic and um of everywhere that we've been in europe we've been talking about this we find we think that czechia is our favorite place it's we've been beautiful to. yeah thank you very much yeah. <laughs> it's a it pleasure was, to hear that it was sort of nice to get to relax after the race instead of just getting yeah. on a plane you know it it worked out Yeah, good. Yeah, that's nice. And we will have a nice dinner now, I hope. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, one more thing uh, about the flying with the dogs. Uh, I know that some people really suffer bad jet lags after transatlantic flights. Do you think is the same for dogs? Do they suffer from kind of jet lag or? No. We haven't noticed it with any of our dogs. Uh, We've brought four different dogs on our various trips and we've only had one dog that didn't do well with the traveling and that is mainly just because he's a nervous dog to yeah. begin with and so you know being around lots of new people it just threw him completely off to and begin with. That was also our first time flying with dogs too, you know, Correct. with him so that could have been part of it also. Yeah. 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 Sure. Uh, okay, let's go back to the Canix uh, mm-hmm. Canix event, Canix Open, the race uh, we organize here. Uh, I was really happy that it was so many people coming. It was more than 600 uh, competitors from all over the world, we can say, because it was also not just the US. We had one competitor from Brazil, mm-hmm. which was awesome. And uh, how, how did you uh, enjoy the race? How did you like it? And what did you like the most about the race? So. What I like the most about the race is just the competition. Um, it's uh, The level of competition is higher over here in Europe than what it is in North America. And it's just fun to have that many people that are that competitive. Mm-hmm. And uh, I really enjoyed the trail. Uh, it, was, it was a very fast trail. Despite it being slightly muddy, it was still very fast. <laughs> right. But um, yeah, I would say just, just the sheer number of people was probably what I enjoyed the most. I think for me, um, we've directed a big race for years. And so to me, it was very well organized and well put together. It was super smooth. So like that is wonderful. But I liked that there were so many different classes. So like people who had small dogs Mm -hmm. could still compete, you know, but they weren't having to compete against a dog that was, you know, at Greyster size. And everyone had a chance to do the sport they love. And mm-hmm. still be competitive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's that's the idea behind. We are trying to make this those classes so everybody can like uh, finds a competitor yeah. of their level because it's just not possible to race with 10 kilo yeah. dog with 36 kilo graster. Mm-hmm. So yeah, yeah, that's that's the idea behind. Do you have uh, similar kind of races uh, back in the U.S.? There's one race in Maine that is similar and has a weight division, mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Um, I can't remember the exact cutoff, but it's it it, it's like thirty or forty pounds, which is um, about fifteen. 15 yeah, kilos, something or like around that. 15 yeah. kilos. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And other than that, uh, you don't have like those divisions. It's everything like one mm-hmm. one class. Yeah, that, that's the only race that I'm aware of yeah. that has divisions for different sizes. Okay. Cars. Okay. So when we started to talk about the racing and uh, mushing scene in the US, is it very popular sport in the US to compete with one dogs? Not, I don't mean just only canicross, but maybe also bike drawing and scooter? Bike joring is the most popular mm-hmm. of the okay. one dog sports that we have, but overall the sport's very small mm-hmm. in the U.S. Um, most of the people that participate in dog powered sports are you know four, six, eight yeah. dog mushers. Um, you kind of the more traditional type kennels. Okay, okay, and is it uh, or are there are they are there some parts uh, in the U.S. which are like. Uh, I would not say well better known but uh, where the sport is more mm. popular than the others of course i know alaska is uh, yeah, sure. the mecca of the mushing but are there any other countries or states so for dry land sports there's really three big areas um, the first is going to be the upper midwest so the states of wisconsin michigan mm-hmm. um, illinois indiana those those states The second is New England, so Maine, New Hampshire, mm-hmm. uh, Massachusetts, and then the last one is the Pacific Northwest, so um, Washington, Oregon, Idaho, Montana. Those are really the three big areas okay. for the sport. Okay. And is it normal for people from those eras to compete together, or it's more like local in those eras? I mean, if it's normal to go from uh, Washington to Maine for competition? Mm-hmm. So it, it depends on the competitor. Mm-hmm. Um, you're, the most competitive people do travel yeah. between areas because they're seeking out the competition with the, the top level competition mm-hmm. in the other groups. Um, but you, you get a few people that travel, but not, not a ton. So. It seems like maybe more are starting to yeah. travel. I've mm-hmm. noticed in the last few years, it seems like we're seeing more people from different places. But yeah. But yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and how long have you been in the sport? I mean, you personally, what are you joy? Yeah, so we got our Alaskan Malamute in 2011. Mm-hmm. So, so um, you like started together? Yeah, we did. We, we got an Alaskan Malamute. Nice. Nick had always wanted one and we found the perfect puppy. Um, and he's what got us started in the sport because he had to have some kind of exercise. Um, we started running with him and then and adopted a, a second dog, a husky mix for me to run with. And we were doing just like local 5Ks and stuff with them for mm, four or five years. Yeah, about that. Yeah. Mm. And then we started, you know, making our way into some dry land sports and, and cane across and and things like that but okay. he still runs his name is ruger he's 12 years old now and okay know, he just won a race on his birthday this year so ah yeah. cool <laughs> yeah and uh is alaskan malamut the most common breed on the comps you have uh, in the u.s no. no it's actually a very rare breed to see um okay. over there it's just like joy said as a kid i fell in love with the breed and always wanted one and really didn't do my research into dog powered sports until after we got him and it was just i wanted malamute and so we had to do something or else he was going to destroy everything we owned (laughs) i know i know yeah it's actually i I had similar story i never wanted or i didn't know anything about a dog powered sport Mm -hmm. but then uh, we got our first graster from my friend because he had uh, not enough time for him so he said do you want the graster and i said Oh, she's so lovely. So we took, <laughs> we took her and then we found out, okay, maybe it's, this is going to be hard <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because yeah. she started yeah. to destroy everything. Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. So then I just, uh, then I just uh, try to do my research and uh-huh. find out there is uh, something called bike joring. Mm-hmm. And I started with that, but uh, I, everything happened just uh, by accident, mm-hmm. I would say. Yeah. yeah. So is it possible to say that some breeds are more common than the others in the dog powered sport in the US? 
In dog powered sports, probably the most common breed is going to be Eurohounds or Alaskan Huskies. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There's a few Graysters in the U.S. Um, it, they're getting to be more, but they're still a minority. Mm-hmm. Um, but like quite a few German short hair pointers too. Just yeah. regular. Yep. Pointers. Mm-hmm. And then quite a few um, purebred Siberian Huskies. Huskies. Okay, okay. And do you breed Graysters in the U.S. or all of them are imported from Europe? Uh, we're getting to where mm-hmm. Graysters are starting to be bred in the U.S. Um, since the pool is so limited, yeah. like Anarchy, for example, I think he's related to yeah. like 95% They're all of related. Graysters yeah. in the U.S. Yeah. There's the same in Europe, don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the best are yeah. related. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, the, they are starting to be bred in the U.S. Um, you still have people importing them from Europe um, just to introduce mm-hmm. new bloodlines and kind of diversify a little mm-hmm. bit. If if you want to buy a dog in the Europe and mm-hmm. bring it into the US, is it a lot of uh, paperwork or it's fairly easy? Depending on which country it's from, it, it depends the level of paperwork. If okay. it's a country that the US has determined is rabies free, so Norway for example, mm-hmm. it's extremely easy. Basically, okay. you just go over there and pick up the puppy and you can more or less walk oh. back into mm-hmm. the country. Okay. With it. If it's not a rabies-free country, there's um, some paperwork you have to fill out, and then you have a um, a eight-week home quarantine. Basically, you can't take the puppy out in public okay. for about two months. But you can have the puppy on your own garden. Yeah. Right. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. My next question is uh, aimed at the training with the dogs uh, in the U.S. If I'm, mm-hmm. let's say, newbie into the sport and want to start canny crossing. Are there any trainers or groups uh, I can join and start the training or you have to find everything mm-hmm. on your own? It depends where you live. Yeah. There are quite a few local clubs that offer group trainings, but um, you're going to have to be close to those. To those. For yeah. example, one of the bigger ones that I can think of is based out of Atlanta, Georgia. Mm-hmm. And so, I mean, if you live within a couple hours of Atlanta, you have a very good resource. If you don't live within a couple yeah. hours of Atlanta, it's a little more difficult. But okay. There's some up, like in the Wisconsin area too. Yeah, but there's... same thing. You have to be close. There. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, the United States is big. Yeah, yeah. It's like <laughs> so. when you take Europe, you can place it there three yeah. times. <laughs> so, yeah. 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 But so, like um, Atlanta, Georgia, the Northeast, um, mm-hmm. Upper Midwest, and the Pacific mm-hmm. West Coast. Um, so the, basically, those areas you said are the like the hotspots for yeah. the yeah. dryland mushing. Mm-hmm. There's there's quite a few local groups in those areas. If you're outside those areas, um, you might be get you might get lucky and have a group close to you. But like for example, with us, the closest group to us is. Uh, we have one group that's a three-hour drive and another mm-hmm. group that's a five-hour drive. Okay. And there are a lot of um, like running stores, you know, um, that have running groups that aren't necessarily like specific for dogs, mm-hmm. but they'll do dog runs or things like that where dogs are welcome. Oh. And there have been a couple times we've gone to something like that and just helped people who might be interested, you yeah. know, learn about the gear and whatnot, but. They're not necessarily training groups for dogs. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I would say it's quite similar in, in Europe. We have some hotspots where it's mm-hmm. very easy to get into the group training, but then yeah, some places you just need to train on your own. Yeah. But on the other hand, for us driving uh, across the whole Czech Republic, yeah. it's three hours. So right, right. Yeah. <laughs> it's like uh, you would say close. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, How about uh, other dog sports? I don't. I mean, like agility or obedience. Mm-hmm. Uh, is it popular in uh, in the US? Uh, mm-hmm. I mean, in in Europe, it's super popular to do dog sports, mm-hmm. especially Czech Republic. We are called uh, called uh, the land of dog owners mm-hmm. because it's every second household uh, is having sure. uh, dog. Is it mm-hmm. similar in in the US? Or there are some again some parts which is more common. I would say for the U.S. as a whole, um, there's a dog sport that's popular in, in every area. area. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and there's really not a place in the U.S. where a dog sport isn't popular. Yeah. It just depends on which dog sport it mm-hmm. is. So, okay. for example, we live in in the Midwest, and there's a lot of um, like hunting trials for dogs. Mm-hmm. Um, that's probably the biggest one around us. In other areas of the country, it's water rescue. 
Um, in other areas, it might be dock diving mm -hmm. or, or agility. Mm -hmm. It just, you know, each one is kind of localized to their mm -hmm. areas. But, mm -hmm. um, scent work and things yeah, like that. Scent work. Yeah, scent work. Scent mm -hmm. work? What, what is that? I uh, so I guess you could go one of two ways with that. So either where the animal is like tracking, you mm -hmm. know, um, the dog is tracking something. Or um, I guess I don't know what you call it when they're like... Maybe like police dog type work, yeah, things like, like that. Okay, yeah. like searching for some kind of uh, mm -hmm. materials or yeah, correct, yeah. yes, yeah, okay, yeah, nice. Uh, you came to check, as we mentioned, with uh, Anarchy, Graster, and one uh, Husky mm -hmm. or mixed Husky. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have uh, more dogs, mm -hmm. except for the Alaskan, uh, your old one? Yeah. <laughs> we, have, home? we have 10 dogs total. Okay. So, <laughs> yeah, then we, you are musher. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We have two Graysters. Yeah. We have um, six Huskies or Husky mixes, one Alaskan Malamute. And then one um, pit bull mix that recently came to live with us. Um, she was my grandma's dog, and my grandma had recently had to move into an assisted living facility, and so she moved in with us. Yeah. Okay, I see. Yeah, that's a lot of work, actually. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, do do you miss them, or is it just so nicely to be just with two dogs? <laughs> I, I I do miss. I them. miss them too. Yeah. But yeah it, it is it's a little bit nice you know to have just a little bit of work but it's we miss them a lot yeah. Fe feeding two dogs takes three minutes whereas yeah. feeding 10 dogs takes 15. yeah i know yeah. i know so you have uh, somebody taking care of them when you are uh, abroad or mm -hmm. at the events yeah my brother and our daughter yeah. are taking care of the rest of the dogs right okay now. and we yeah, have nice. several friends who will step in and help because it's a big ordeal to take care of that many dogs yeah, you know it and you it's hard to want to ask someone hey are you willing to feed you know 10 dogs yeah. while we're away yeah. for a week yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, definitely definitely and do you live uh, in a countryside or more mm -hmm. in the city mm -hmm. We live in the countryside. Yeah. In the countryside, okay, yeah. Um, I have one more question about the dogs in the U.S. and that is how uh, is it normal to have the dogs uh, unleashed when you are outside, or it's also very specific for every era. Mm. If you're in the countryside, it's very normal for them to be unleashed. Yeah. In fact, it's almost a problem mm -hmm. because, for example, like I, I'm a runner and mm -hmm. I go out on runs all the time and. It's very common to be chased by loose dogs. Okay. Um, now, if you're in the cities, uh, most cities require the dogs to be on a leash. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, and sure. there's a, I mean, you, there's a difference when you run too. I, I do a lot of my runs in the city where I work, and just because that's when I have the time. Mm -hmm. um, and I will hear a dog bark, and and at home I'm so used to them being loose. You know, it's like looking everywhere. Where is it? And oh, it's in a yard or it's on a leash. Yeah. Know? So yeah. yeah. Okay, so it's there is no like special law that you can't have the dog loose in the U.S. If if there is, it's by it's by each city. Yeah, each city, each city has city. Okay. its own rules. Yeah. 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 yeah, perfect. So it's not like a federal law that it's not, not correct. Allowed. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Cool. Uh, yeah, I have question now about your training. How do you train your dogs for for the dog powered sports? So uh, we mix up our training. We do. Um, a lot of cane across with the dogs mm -hmm. and then we also do cart or atv training with them it just kind of depends how many dogs we're running if we're going to run you know, mm. six of the dogs sure. like, if we're going to run all the husky that time we'll hook them up to the atv mm -hmm. just gets a little safer yeah um, <laughs> <laughs> definitely but you know for just training like the two gracers we'll hook them up to the cart and mm -hmm. just take them out and do some hill work especially hill work on the car is um, mm -hmm. where we do a lot of training okay how, how what do you mean by hill work so where we live, it, it's actually very similar to this area yeah. of the Czech mm -hmm. Republic where it's quite hilly. Mm -hmm. And so the trails that we train on, we just, we don't avoid the hills. We make the dogs work mm -hmm. up them and try yeah. to get, yeah. try to build up the, the strength and the endurance. Yeah, it's almost like their cart work is sort of like their strength training. Like we would go to the gym, you know, and lift yeah. weights, like that's their equivalent. Yeah. Of so that. it's like slow pace and quite hard pulling. Yes. Yeah. 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 more or less I sit on the cart and just hold the brakes and that's, <laughs> that's about all I do yeah, yeah 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 it's a uh, very interesting for me because all the guests I have in the podcast and I have uh, many very good mushers here and uh, I think all of them just told me the same that you need to build up slow mm -hmm. 
hard uh, work to build up the muscles mm -hmm. and don't run too fast to burn your dog out. Yeah. When I was first getting into dog power sports, a very accomplished musher told me, you have to train slow to race fast. Yeah. And that's mm -hmm. kind of how we build our training program. Yeah, yeah definitely, definitely. Um, we are slowly coming to end of my list of questions, but uh, we spoke uh, yesterday with Joy and you told me that you run a non-profit yeah. organization. Yes. And I was really impressed by what uh, you it's are doing. Cool. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty cool what you are doing because if I understood well, you train the dogs, uh, which help uh, to the war veterans, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Can Can you say a bit more about sure. that? How that works? Sure. So the organization is called Canines for Camo, and it was started by a veteran, um, the U.S. military, and. Um, his vision with that was to help other veterans who were coming home with PTSD and you know post-traumatic stress disorders and mm -hmm. and um, other health issues that they may might have encountered you know um, coming out of the military and so the dogs are trained to you know maybe wake someone up when they're having a nightmare or if they're in a public place and they're getting anxious and nervous the dog is there to help comfort and can knows exactly what to do to calm their human down okay. um, they can also help with if a veteran is suffering you know maybe not very stable when they walk so they can help with that stability mm -hmm. and they can make them feel safe by posting in front of them and blocking and things like that um, they can also um, we train them to alert for seizures or uh, we have diabetic alert dogs as well who can help if someone's blood sugar is high or low and they need help. So okay. all of these dogs are trained specifically for what the veterans in our program are needing. Okay. Um, and the, the really cool thing to me is the trainers that train these dogs are in our prison system. So they're offenders or that's, inmates who yeah, are, that's really who cool. are, you yeah. know, um, especially many of them won't, won't ever get out. They'll be in there for life. And okay. so this gives them a purpose. And so they are able to have all the training tools that they need and they work with the dogs mm -hmm. to train them for whatever vet, the veteran needs. So um, do they train yeah. the, the inmates, do they train them uh, in the prison facility or do mm -hmm. they train yeah. them outside? Yep, so the dogs, um, we have, they stay in one specific wing of the prison. So all the trainers stay there and the dog gets to stay with them mm -hmm. um, through the entirety of its training. So the dogs go to the prison and stay for, you know, six weeks, six months, however long they need to be there. Okay. Yeah. And do, do you use the different breeds uh, for the training? So they're all rescue dogs. So they're all different breeds. Um, there are a lot of hound mixes, mm -hmm. um, a lot of pit bull mixes. Uh, we don't use as many huskies or northern breeds, partially because uh, they require a little bit extra exercise and care that mm -hmm. sometimes a veteran with a health issue may have a hard time giving the dog. Yeah. Um, but we did have an Alaskan Malamute in the program. Um, and so, yeah, so there's all kinds of breeds, but they're usually larger, larger mm -hmm. dogs. Mm -hmm. yeah. And what I'm quite surprised is that it's people who are in the prison, the inmates training them. Mm -hmm. uh, do they need to have some uh, previous experience with the dogs to be able to join your program? So they have to, if they're interested in being part of our program, they have to be on like best behavior. You know, these are, they're people who are really trying to make their lives better mm -hmm. and they don't have to have any previous dog training experience. We have a team of trainers who goes into the prison and trains the inmates on how to train okay. and then goes in, you know, once, twice, maybe three times a month and just kind of checks in, see mm -hmm. what they need and we get them all the tools that they need to, yeah. to train. And of course, there's a few things they can't do. Uh, they can't take them in public. You know, they can't take them to a restaurant or a store to see how they're going to yeah. do. But they do all their basic training skills mm -hmm. there. Yeah, yeah, it's it's really fantastic because you are actually, I think it's the first time I heard about the nonprofit, which is helping two groups of yeah, persons yeah. in the same time, yes. because it's not only war veterans mm -hmm. or inmates, mm -hmm. it's just both of them, or that's the way I, I see that. Yeah, and if, um, you know, so 
some we actually have one gentleman who's going to be released from prison this fall and so part of our program too is helping the inmates who have trained for us when they get out mm -hmm. um, and that's either you know maybe they're they become a trainer for us maybe we help them find another job but part of yeah. that is is helping them reintegrate into society, society. yeah right yeah, yeah. okay uh very last question for both of you. What are your plans uh, for this season? I mean, the race season or the training season? Sure. <laughs> yeah. So hopefully, um, you know, IFSS just announced that the World Championships is not going to be in France. <laughs> hopefully we'll know where that's going to be. But our goal would Let's be... Let's cross the fingers. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Our goal is to go to both ICF and IFSS mm -hmm. this fall mm -hmm. and, and compete at both of those events. Yeah. Yeah, cool. Yeah. yeah. Same, same thing. And we are we're running coaches too. So we have and we have a lot of cane across athletes that we train. Okay. So I'm really excited about because a lot of them are also planning to go to those events uh -huh. about getting to like watch our athletes really compete. Yeah, cool, cool. Yeah. Yeah. Do, yeah. do you have some organization uh, in the US which you need to be member of to join the IS, uh, ECF or the IFSS? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, events or you just join on your own yeah so the the u.s federation is usfss and <laughs> you have to be a member of that to go to either one of those events okay yeah okay yeah thank you very much for joining yeah. us it was a pleasure having you here i'm sorry for my english it's uh quite difficult for me to figure out all the words no, so we think it's really good we think it's so, great so, so uh, hopefully everybody will understand me and yeah, yeah. Uh, well, your english is far better than both of our checks so. yeah yeah I that i believe <laughs> Okay, yeah, thank you very much and uh, wish you a safe trip home and I really wish that we meet again this fall at yes. the, at the Hydro of the Oaks events. Yeah. Thank yeah. you for having yeah. us. Thank you.